I like how um, Isabel Wilkerson goes back to chapters after the pillars. It's chapter 10 now. Um, oh goodness, this is so close. <laughs> oh God, it's even closer. There we go. I was. You'll see it on YouTube if you go to YouTube. Um, chapter 10, Central Miscasting. I arrived in London on a slate gray morning in December 2017 for a major conference on a topic that had begun to consume my waking hours, cast. Unlike many events I attend, I was going there to listen, to gain a greater understanding of that which I did not know rather than to speak myself. I'd be surrounded by people who studied what seemed to be the missing codes to human ruptures. The issue of caste was, to my mind, the basis of every other ism. These researchers were now my intellectual tribe. These were people who could see past the hierarchies and false divisions that undermine the species. Mm. Ooh, foreshadowing, I don't know. The auditorium was packed with sociologists, political scientists, anthropologists, graduate students, and I could barely contain myself as I took a seat in the front. A woman who appeared to be of East Asian descent removed her jacket and nodded. There was no flinching or scooting away. There were no quizzical side eyes and as might happen in a similar setting in the States. I was feeling better already. I took a measure of the crowd and noticed that here at the crossroads of the world, there was no one else at the conference who looked like me. Most everyone appeared to be descended from South Asia, meaning India, or from Europe, primarily the UK. Not one person of African descent, from what I could tell. Only two or three Americans, all of them white and based in Europe or India. I alone had crossed the Atlantic for this single day of attempting to understand the forces that had shaped the course of my life and those of my ancestors and of many other people before me. While I had studied the unspoken caste structure in the United States, I had not yet spent time on the original caste system of India. As with many, conserv as with many conversations about injustice, the talks turned almost exclusively on the victims and consequences of societal ills rather than on their origins. Panel after panel looked through a different lens at the suffering of the lowest castes, which in India have been called the, quote, scheduled castes, or shocking to American ears, the, quote, backwards ca the backward castes. I began to see parallels with America, heard stories that could have been taken from the headlines in the United States about African Americans and indigenous people. Both countries had abolished legal discrimination, and yet, according to the panels and keynotes, Dalits were being brutalized by Indian authorities as African Americans were being brutalized by police in the United States. And a people known as the Adivasi were fighting to retain their lands and culture in India, as have the indigenous people in America. Two different countries, oceans apart, had found parallel ways to contain the subordinate groups within them. I could close my eyes, change the names as I listened to these reports and feel that I was back in the United States. Quote, another Delhi murdered by police, another Adivasi murdered by the police, a woman said. Quote, why do we not face up to the outrage of state sanctioned violence? End quote. At the first break, I was anxious to get a copy of the papers the scholars had read that morning. I had decided early on that I was not going to lean on any recognition that might accrue to me from my first book. In fact, I purposely kept a quiet profile so as not to attract attention to this new project that I was then still germinating in my head. I was there on the strength of my own personal presentation, there to be accepted for what people could see. A well-dressed woman, an American, an African-American, well-spoken and focused. I went up to a professor, an Indian woman, an upper caste woman, as I would come to realize, who seemed to be in charge. I asked if I might get a copy of the papers that were presented. Would they be made available? She said, no. You'll have to wait. Why do you need a copy? Uh, I'm a writer, this quotes, this is Isabel. I'm a writer and I have come all the way from America just for this, I told her. 
I thought that this level of dedication might impress her. It did not. She directed me to an Englishman who is her senior, and it seemed that even here, among people who studied caste, there might be traditional hierarchy at work. The woman was then pulled away by the press of people, and the Englishman was swamped as well. As in any human grouping, there were cliques and fraternities of people who had known one another or worked together, and rather than an open conference, this was starting to feel like a family reunion to which I had been admitted by accident. At the lunch break, I spotted a gentleman who was sitting alone, across from other men who were talking to one another. He was Indian, like three quarters of the attendees, but he was different. He was carrying a black briefcase, all business and purposeful amid the backpacks surrounding us. Like me, he seemed an outsider among insiders. I felt an immediate kinship. His name, he told me as I took a seat next to him, was Tushar. He was born in Bengal and was a geologist now living in London. He was more formally dressed than everyone else, blue Oxford shirt collar peeking above his gray tweed jacket, a side part in his thick gray hair, his eyes smiling in quarter moons on his warm, kind face as he talked. Quote, according to the caste system, he said, as if informing me of the status of someone he once knew, I belong to the second upper caste, the warrior soldier caste. I looked at this man who was not much taller than I, small boned, narrow shouldered, gentle of face, self self effacingly modest in bearing, and wondered on what planet would this man be seen as a natural born warrior? Here was living proof proof of the miscasting of caste. This had long ago registered to him as well, and he took the caste ascription with so little solemnity, solemnity, a, that he was not at first able to give the exact spelling of the caste, or in Sanskrit, the varna to which he was born. I did not yet know the four varnas at the time, or that castes were even called varnas, so I asked him to write it down for me. He wrote the words Katriya, and then Kayastras, Kayastras, in my notepad. I'm like adding Spanish roles, and they should not be. I think it's Kshatriya, he said, as if to disregard its significance by misremembering how to spell it or pronounce it. It's an issue not well understood. I was raised with social privilege. You are told you're a second upper caste, the ruling caste, and that you were to be happy that you are there, that there are many below you, end quote. But as a young boy on the way to school, he passed the beggars on the streets asking for money and people crying out that they had no food. His own family sat down to meals with four or five courses, dal and amaranth, mutton and chutney, while less well-off families subsisted on rice and potatoes and those beneath them on even less. It was hard to enjoy one's privilege when so few people had it. When he was 11 or 12, he began asking why his family had so much and others so little. Quote, don't discuss about these things, the elders told him. Do your studies. Cast is created by God. The afternoon sessions were about to begin. Discussions of Dalit protests and corporate encroachment on the land of the Adivasis, Tushar, and I headed back to the auditorium, each of us on our respective missions. As this was England, there was a break for tea, and I gravitated to Tushar again in the crowd. He looked forlorn and impatient now. Quote, they haven't answered my questions, he said. All my life I have lived with this. I am looking for answers about how this began. I will stay to hear more. He asked why I had come all the way from America for this conference. I told him I wanted to understand caste because I lived with it too. I told him most people don't think of America as having a caste system, but it has all the hall hallmarks of one. He listened and did not judge. I underlined that apparently. Quote, caste defines everything in India, he said. It is the Hindu religion that maintains the caste system. That is why Ambedkar became a Buddhist. It was not an escape for him, it was a liberation. Casteism is another form of racism. God knows how long it will take for people to let it go. I am wondering then, are you still a Hindu? I asked him. I am atheist, he said, no religion since I was 13. What does your family think of that? They think you are born a Hindu, you die a Hindu. You do not escape caste, but I believe what I believe. Who cares what they think? 
He appeared to have given some consideration to what I had told him about the hierarchy in America. It had puzzled him and intrigued him. If you have caste in the U.S., he asked me, where are you in the caste system? That is the question that many Indians ask in one form or another upon meeting a fellow Indian. It is a line of inquiry that those in the lowest caste know is coming and that they dread. Indians will ask the surname, the occupation of one's father, the village one is from, the section of the village that one is from, to suss out the caste of whoever is in front of them. They will not rest until they have uncovered the person's rank in the social order. Tushar had waited quite some time to ask me this and would not likely have done so or thought of it at all if I hadn't mentioned caste in America. The idea seemed a wonderment to him. He seemed to want to know how things worked and where I fit into what to him was an alien hierarchy. I had not expected this question. Nobody has ever asked me before, how could he not know? Was he merely being polite? Hollywood and the news media have exported demeaning images of African Americans for generations, which means our reputations often precede us, and not for the better. So I was, in fact, strangely grateful for his giving me an option. Even without the language of caste, most any American would know the ranking of the group to which I was born. But here was a man born upper caste in India and a skeptic of inherited status, seeing me as an individual who might be of any rank. He was not putting me in a box, nor making assumptions that I labor under every day. Oh, nor making the assumptions that I labor under every day. His question was liberating in its innocent lack of judgment, yet it brought to mind Dr. King's epiphany nearly six, 60 years before in India. Well, I told Tushar, in America, I am assigned the lowest caste, the American untouchables. I am an American Dalit and I am living proof that caste is artificial. He gave a look of recognition. My answer was further confirmation of what he considered a disease. We would, have other, we would have other conversations in the following months whenever I visited London. He would share more of the absurdities he had witnessed in the caste system back home. He remembered the Dalit students whose exams went ungraded. The tests were not marked he said, because the teacher was upper caste and would not touch the paper touched by a Dalit. So you laugh or you cry, end quote. He told me about the upper caste woman in an office where he once worked. She would get up from her desk and walk the length of the office down the hall and around the corner to ask a Dalit to get her water. The jug was there next to her desk, he said. That Dalit had to come to where she was sitting and pour it for her. It was beneath her dignity to get the water herself from the desk beside her. This is the sickness, the sickness of caste. He recalled the heartbreak of the Indian fixation on skin color, which was caste within caste and the hatred of darker Indians who tend to be lower caste, but not always, and how they suffer for this accident of faith, as do African Americans and other people of color in the United States and in other parts of the world. His older sister happened to be darker than most of his siblings, and when she reached courting age, she was told she would have to boil milk and skim the skin from the boiled milk and spread it on her face prior to sleep every night before the young men came to interview her for marriage. Imagine, he said, week after week, night after night, she knew she would be rejected and she would close the door to her room and cry. I was 12, I remember to this day. She got married, but that's not the point. She should not have to go through all of this, the cruelty of it, end quote. We had both been miscast, each in our own way, and could see through the delusion that had shaped and restricted us from the other side of our respective caste systems. We had broken from the matrix and were convinced that we could see what others could not, and that others could see it too if they could awaken from their slumber. We had defied our caste assignments. He was not a warrior or a ruler. He was a geologist. I was not a domestic. I was an author. He had defied his caste from on high and I from below. And we had met at this moment in London at our own magno line of equality, standing on different sides of the same quest to understand the forces that had sought to define us, but had failed. Chapter 10. 
I like when it has chapters. <laughs>